and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In my second verse, as we pray, Genesis 12, verse 1, he says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will make you a name great, and you will be a blessing. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this historical moment, Father God, for bringing us here together. Lord, at the launch of this public service, Commercial Union, Father God of South Africa, we want to honor you in every single step, Father God. Lord, your word declares that the step of the righteous men and women are ordered by God. And Lord, without you, we are nothing. For in you we live, we move, and have our being. And this morning, Father God, lead away. We surrender all of our plans, all of our ways unto you, Lord. For you are the finisher the, and the author of our lives. You are the Alpha and Omega. And Lord, thank you for keeping us this far. Lord, we are faced with many onslaughts, Father God, left and right upon our lives in this world. But we will never lose hope, for you are the one who hope and who holds tomorrow. Our trust is in you. For you will declare trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not in your own understanding, but acknowledge the Lord in everything that you do. And Lord, as this union is launched today, Father God, we want to acknowledge you and surrender every plan and every step, Father God, unto your Lordship. Have your way, Lord. Lord, I bring, Father God, the leadership of this union, Father God, under your Lordship. I bring you, Father God, to be the center of the way forward. Protect them, Father God. The coming and the going, Father God, it shall be protected, Father God. Give them favor and grace in everything, Lord, that they want to achieve in the landscape of this country, of this continent, and worldwide, for Heavenly Father. Lord, I decree and I declare your blessing upon them, Father God. And we also bring into remembrance our brother that we lost in this year, Ivan Philip Fredericks, Father God, who was part of all of this, Father God, in this vision and to see this great union come into fruition. And God, we thank you, Father God, that you will take this union and this workers, Father God, to greater heights, Father God. For you are the center of it all. We give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory unto you. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm telling Silo here that uh, I'm going to do the translation in Arabic. So please bear with me if you don't understand. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulil Kareem. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar. Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma. Inna ka anta al-wahab Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun Wa salamuna ala al-mursaleen Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen That's Robar All right Um I will also want to acknowledge uh, that before Islam, before Christianity, we come from somewhere as black people. And as a result, I just want all of us just to observe a moment of silence to reflect on who we are and what we carry. And why are we here? Because of we are representing communities 
of our father's side, our mother's side. And just for a moment, let us acknowledge our Koko Nabomku. Let us acknowledge that Snabo Gogo, Snanabomkulu, Zihamba Nabokokwana. But also, let us acknowledge that where we are is the result that we've forgotten who we are. And the moment we forgot or we forget who we are, then we become the victims of everyone. You'll be made to run from pillar to pole because of we've forgotten. The center which we represent, the DNA, the bloodlines which we carry. We are the meeting points of families. We are the meeting points of families. We are the meeting points of many generations. And we carry a powerful and a resilient DNA. But the question arises, are we conscious of who we are? So hence, as we are here um, at this event, I just want us also to acknowledge that all of us, we are here to make a difference. And I want to introduce uh, Tahir with a story. We are told that in a lab, they took 12 reds. And firstly, six of them, they were thrown into a tank of water. And they were swimming, and after 30 minutes, they drowned. And they took the next six. They were thrown into the same tank, and they were allowed to swim. And after some few uh, minutes also, they were removed from that tank. And they were thrown back to the same tank. But now, amazingly, the second group, it managed to swim for more than 12 hours. Then we ask a question, why did the second group manage to swim beyond 12 hours? Because it was under the impression that when it clocks that number, someone will rescue it. And therefore, we ask a question. If hope, if hope can move a red to that level, then the question is, what can hope do to a human being? And all of us, to a certain degree, we are hopes to other people around you. And you'll discover that you are a hope the moment you sit on your post. When you understand why you are here, then you become a hope of other people. And I think also the launch today, it is the testimony also of that hope. That it will also give hope to other people who are, who are disillusioned, who are disappointed by the unions which they belong to. And Tahir... I hope you'll give them hope. And on that note, can you grace us with your presence? Can we give him a round of applause? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, comrades, colleagues, friends, thank you very much for honoring us and to have availed yourself to be part of this launch. When those who felt that there's a need for an alternative a trade union came forth and said that it is becoming unbearable for us to remain in stagnation whilst we as the workers are continuously struggling and suffering. 
we need an alternative voice. A voice that will understand the hurt and the pain of the workers. A voice that will rise above greed. A voice that will rise above a need for self-gratification. A voice that will not be led by leaders who only care about their self-interest. Now, the issue is that where do you get that voice? How do you guarantee that this organization will indeed be different from the rest? And the founders who initiated this process are the people who can be able to stand up and say that we are those people because we have been in this business and we have never been accused of ever selling out the interest of the workers. South Africa has many challenges and we tend to attribute every challenge that the workers are going through to a number of things. The most recent one that we are using as a reason why workers are suffering is COVID. But nobody dared to say that workers have been struggling before COVID. Workers have been working under squalor conditions before COVID. Workers have been exploited before COVID. Workers have been expected practically to make miracles in their workstations despite the fact they don't have the infrastructure or the ability or the necessary human resources to fulfill their mandates before COVID. However, COVID is now a reason why the workers are unable to be paid fair wages to guarantee their employment and to safeguard their hard-earned earnings. We have become a society of excuses why things are going wrong. What is more painful is that if we are able to identify all these problems, how come we haven't identified solutions? Are these problems man-made and deliberate or we are simply being led by fools? I have no answer to that. What I know is that the suffering in our beloved country goes beyond those who are employed. We have millions of able men and women with degrees, qualifications, knowledge, and the know-how who are queuing to receive 350 from SASA. This is the country that we were promised that it will be heaven on earth. And things are not getting better in our be beloved country. In spite of all of this, significant changes in economic environment, labor management relation in South Africa has not changed to any significant extent from the previous two decades. Despite the fact that we ushered in, we shut, we ushered in democracy with a hope for a better life, 
we see our people, our children, roaming the streets of this country, and abating the oppressors of the working class. We need to start holding government responsible for the mess that this country is in. However, it should also be understood that there is no way that government can be corrupt as it is without the involvement of the private sector. Because everything that government procures, it gets procured through the private sector. Government doesn't produce, private sector produces. And if there's corruption in between, it means that both government and private sector are involved. We should not lose sight of the fact that we may, be wake, we may be able to wake up every day and go and buy bread like we used to buy bread 10 years ago. However, Zimbabwe didn't become this Zimbabwe overnight. It became this Zimbabwe gradually, where the people glorified leaders instead of taking charge of their own lives. There is no leader that will come and rescue us or rescue the working class. We need to rescue ourselves. We need to liberate ourselves. However, it is going to be very difficult when we have trade unions, powerful trade unions, who support that oppression. Where without a blink of an eye, leaders are willing to sign agreements where workers get 1.5% without any mandates. An agreement like that you don't have to sign. You just say to government, implement if you want to. An agreement that says in future if we are unable to reach an agreement, this agreement will take precedence. It is the madness of our decade where we are unable to identify the difference between employers and the unions. 
Unions and employers, they dine together, they dance together at the expense of the working class. And the workers see this. The workers feel this pain. But the workers don't have a voice or somebody who's willing to stand up for them. And PSEU came out of those cries, out of that pain that workers are paying hundreds of millions of rents to unions only to be sold out at the blink of an eye. We are not going to be enemies of any trade union. But if for us to get to those who are oppressing us, we have to go through them, we'll do it without hesitation. Fortunately, we were made to fear no one but the creator who created us. So therefore, not even death will be a consideration. Because any human being who lives on this earth ultimately is going to die. But we will rather die having fulfilled our obligation towards our creator and our people instead of selling our souls for the crumbs that falls from the master's table. We are going to stand up and raise issues that have been forgotten. We still have the Stellenbosch boys in the Western Cape enjoying the caviar and expensive wines after having lost billions and billions of workers' pensions. And our leaders have no guts, no the ability to stand up and get these people and bring them to books because their survival is dependent on them. One of the first things that we'll be doing once our registration goes through is to open a criminal case against Steinhoff directors. <laughs> we have prepared a dossier with all the criminality they've done at the expense of the workers. And we are going to pursue it until such a time we see elements like Marcus Yoste be brought to book. We have been made to believe that corruption is synonym to our leaders like Jacob Zuma and others when we know that if they are corrupt, because I don't have any evidence, but if they are corrupt, they only ate the crumbs that fell from the master's table and the master is sitting somewhere in Stellenbosch and those beautiful estates. We are public service and commercial union. We are going into the banking sector. The banking sector for decades has been run by a union that is not a union. Thousands of workers have lost their jobs in the banking sector because in the bedroom of deception, that union and the executives of banks, they sleep together, they dine together. They have never looked after the interest of our people. Our people have suffered in the hands of these unions and these employers. We are coming for you, the banking sector. And within two years, the PSEU, we guarantee you, will be the majority union in the banking sector. <laughs> the unions who've been operating in institutions like SAA and SCOM. All this corruption happened under your watch. All the suffering that the workers are going through, they happened whilst you were there. It is time to get out of the way. Let the PSU fix this thing. We are not overly ambitious. We are hopeful because our hearts are pure. Our intention is pure. We want to fix what you cannot fix because you broke it yourself. We intend to be that shield that will protect 
the workers and their families. Because for every worker that loses their job, there's 10 to 20 people that are going to be affected. We cannot have a country where the majority of its people are dependent on social grants. It's unsustainable. We who are happen to be able to have jobs and to work, you are going to be taxed to death because government can only get money from the taxes. And if less and less people are working, which is the case now, and we don't see any opportunity or any moves to try and fix what is broken. Because the people who are trying to fix what is broken, they are the ones who broke it themselves. We as the workers, we need to start waking up and smell the coffee. Because our children are going to be the victims of circumstances. And if we are not going to be resolute, we are not going to sacrifice, we are not going to stand for this thing, we are not going to commit to this organization, those of us who are privileged to be part of this founding organization, just remember, if you don't, others will come and take it forward. PSCU is not going to fail either way. I'm happy today that I have people, friends, who, when I approached them and said to them, the workers have requested us to find, found a new trade union that will be different from what they have. They said to me, what do you need, Tahir? I said, help us to put it together. We don't have financial capacity. We don't have the financial muscles. We don't draw subscriptions to the value of millions of rents. But we have a heart to make this thing work. They said, Wabala Wala, what do you want? I said, help me to put together a conference that will lead to the registration of PSCU. They said, what do you want? And I told them what I want, and they made all this possible. <laughs> Everything that you see here, it doesn't come from any subscription of any worker is from friends and those who believe in our vision. Some of them are sitting in here. They don't want to be known because they didn't help us in order to get something out of this. They believe that indeed we are going to succeed. And I don't want to mention names of some of the distinguished guests that are going to be before you who are going to speak. But I want to say something about one person. That is Professor Mtunjo. Professor Mtunzi Mdwaba is in our presence. This is a brilliant man. A brilliant man. One of the best products of this soil. This is the man who's been the helm of the ILO for many years. And when he was approached to contest for the position of the Director General of ILO, some idiots in our government decided that they are not going to support him. Now, if you are a government and you have one of your own, and for the first time, Africa has an opportunity to be the Director General of the LO, and you say you are not going to support him because he's not part of your close circle of deception and corruption, despite the fact he's one of the best minds that this country has ever produced, then go to hell. We will support him. We will do everything in our power 
to speak to our friends across the globe that Professor Mdwaba becomes the first African ILO Director General. And he's not going to get there because of deployment. Thank God you didn't even support him because he's going to get there on the basis of skill, knowledge, and ability. <laughs> so, you are so unpatriotic to the extent that you are willing to throw one of your own in a dustbin so that somebody else from Europe should come in as a director general of the ILO. That's how much you love others more than us. You have demonstrated your inability to lead us with dignity. We've stood back looking at your corruption and your maladministration. Now you are making this country to even lose an opportunity of a lifetime. But God is with Dr. Mdwaba, and we are also going to be with him. Now, comrades, this is the easy part. The most difficult part is what happens after this. And after this, we will see who's committed and who's not. But like I said, whether you support or not, PSCU, by the grace of God, will succeed. Thank you very much. Amanda, 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 I, I normally ask comrades that we have, you know, we say this slogan, but the question, do we really understand power? Because of sometimes we, we say Amanda, and in response you say away to but do you really have power? And this has been demonstrated uh, in the past because of time. It has been demonstrated in our government, in our governance, because if you are controlled and you are running the government, it's said, eh? You have the power, you are running institutions, but you are the one who's begging We have also unions which have power, but they don't know what it is. So this is the sad space which we find ourselves in. And I hope that when we say, Amanda, you will reflect and ask yourself a question. Do I really have this power? Do we really have this power? And on that note, Tahir, you, you touch on the most important issues. We must liberate ourselves from ourselves. Because of the problem is no one outside us. We allowed the situations to carry on. And we, we keep on allowing it. And on that note, um, I will call upon Mr. Mike Donson, um, who is a, a leadership trainer. Uh, he's going to talk about leadership development. And as he's gracing us, uh, in, Sizwana, in Sizwana, the leader, the name, the leader is Mweta Pili. And what is interesting about this word is that it has Mweta, meaning the one who visits Pili in the future. So vision is linked to leading. And therefore, we can't be leaders without a vision. We can't be leaders if you don't imagine the future, where we want to go. On that note, that it. I'm going to take my mask off. Well, good morning. Uh, I'm just going to set up here. Let me start off by saying this. In life, when things go wrong, 
they go wrong because of leadership. When things go right, they go right because of leadership. Excuse me. I'm, I'm from the old school where we use a mouse. <laughs> and So let me say a little something about myself. 1977, no, 1987 to 89, I was the chairman of the CWIU, which is the, chair, uh, the Chemical Workers Industrial Union. I sat in the negotiations for this, this, invest, this investment of mobile. Sullivan from America was putting a lot of pressure on companies from America to either treat their workers the same or disinvest. Uh, so, way back then I understood that leadership is about sacrifice. Leadership is about getting up and doing what needs to be done. Leadership has to be visionary. Somebody mentioned something about vision. It is said that when a, f that a fish rots from the head. Now, what Tahrir was talking about in our country, that there's a dearth of leadership, it's not just in our country, it's in the world. The world is in a terrible state because there's no leadership. Now, here's the interesting thing. Most of us can perform and are leaders naturally. And that is not where we fail. Where we do fail is in the technical side. Right? How to communicate. How to build teams. How to understand what phase or level our teams are in. So there's four stages. You're either forming, storming, norming or performing. This team, in this, at this time, I guess, one can say it's forming. But it takes visionary leadership to get the players together. Uh, when I was asked uh, in 2002 to start a passenger services union, uh, not union, sorry, passenger services division at Durban International Airport, I had no experience whatsoever. All I knew is how to buy a ticket, how to get an aircraft, and off I go. But I learned an interesting lesson some years earlier. No leader is complete in themselves. And any leader who thinks they are, are really fooling themselves. So a leader must identify their weaknesses, their shortcomings. We'll say something about that just now. And then complement the right kind of people around them who will help take the ball over the line. Uh, Tayyip spoke about commitment. Many of us in various expressions, in various organizations are involved, but not committed. Now, you might say, what's the difference between being involved and being committed? Okay. To illustrate that, I'm going to give you this example. The chicken goes to the pig and says, let's give our owners breakfast. The pig says to the chicken, easy for you to say, because you are involved in breakfast. You lay an egg and off you go. But for me to provide bacon, I've got to give my life. That is commitment. But then it's up to leadership to make sure that the vision is completely clear and people are committed, well, to the vision, but it begins with the leader. The leader's got to demonstrate that to those that follow. Uh, also, we have to be unselfish. This bit about self-promotion is a terrible thing wherever you find it. 
Uh, mothers understand this very well. Fathers, I'm on your side. <laughs> but mothers understand this very, very, very well. Unselfish. They give of their time from dawn till dusk. If we want to be the right kind of leaders, that is what we have to do. I'll talk about the technical side just now. And then there's this thing called wisdom. You know, we've been told that it is good to be transparent and it's good to be honest and upfront and communicate freely. Well, it's good, but it's not the best. Because wisdom says you must know what to say, when to say it, and to whom to say it, and how to say it. You can't stand exposed to everybody just because they're on the same boat as you. Why? Because people might be hitching a ride. And when they get to the first port, they're going to sell you short. You have to identify who are the people who are committed. Wisdom is the only thing that's going to give you that, shall we call, uh, uh, that attribute. Leadership, true leadership, is never for sale, regardless. Now, when I worked at Johannesburg International Airport, um, which is one of the gateways into the country, I had a hit on my life. N not music, somebody put a hit out to take me out of the way. <laughs> Why? Because I didn't know that in trying to promote and develop somebody in my team, I was actually interfering with their livelihood. Now you might say, Mike, why would you want to interfere with somebody's livelihood? Well, this is what this person was doing. They were allowing illegals into the country. Right? So, for one illegal into the country, if you came on an international flight, you were routed to domestic where you were not checked. And this person was making $15,000 per person. So I became a cheap target. I didn't know that uh, until I left. So there's a story at the airport that goes like this. Now the mischief makers, the miscreants, the devious deviants, will sit alongside you in the food court and listen to what you have to say. If you demonstrate you are dissatisfied with your company, then they know you're a target and a target for sale. But this is what I learned many years ago, that you can never be committed to other people if you're not first committed to yourself. You can never sell other people out if you don't first sell yourself out. My brother says it like this. You can't, be a, you can't show a pig that it's a pig by becoming a pig. Okay? So, leadership must not be for sale, regardless. And, of course, leadership must be accountable. Leadership is about initiative. It's about ownership and its productivity. Now, where most organizations fail, especially, well, um, let me talk about this country because it's doing particularly bad in this regard. We don't understand that every, unless we develop everybody in the company, unless we communicate the vision to everybody in the company, unless we demonstrate loyalty to everybody in the company, from the floor sweeper to the CEO, we create a tremendous weak link in the company. Everybody is a leader. I'm sure you'll agree with me. Uh, the lady who makes tea or the guy who sweeps the floor doesn't take his CEO home and allow his CEO to run his home. He runs his own home. Why? Because he's a leader. So I'm saying that to say this. This, this part is the natural part. This is the, where the values sit. Honesty, integrity, uh, commitment, 
it depends on how you were raised. This is the natural part that is untrained. And that's not necessarily where we fail. On the technical side, however, there's what is called effective personal productivity. You know, it's very interesting for me, and I've come across many leaders. I've developed many leaders in the private sector and in the private sector. And I found something very interesting with most of them. They have wonderful goals for their company. They have amazing visions for their organizations. But they don't have goals and visions for their own lives. So the question becomes, if you're not leading yourself, if you're not setting goals, if you're not achieving goals in your own personal life, how can you be committed to the goals and visions of an organization? And what can you say about overcoming if you don't overcome in your own personal space? Effective personal productivity looks also at how you manage yourself. You know, there's this whole thing that's going through business today. Time management. But since Adam, until now, nobody's ever been able to manage time. You can't manage time. Impossible. Well, Joshua stopped the sun, but that was that. You manage yourself in time. So if I were to ask any one of us here... How was 2021 so far? The only person who can stand up and say it was a time, a period of value, is the one who set goals and accomplished them. It's the only credible way to measure your life and to measure time. Time management. You also, we have also been told not to sweat the small stuff. You've heard that? Okay. Not to sweat the small stuff. But every big thing is made up of small stuff. Now in the good book it says that it's the little foxes that spoil the vineyard. The little things. That stone in your shoe will keep you from completing the comrades marathon. I know some of us have never even tried that, uh, that race. <laughs> and then we have this is the technical side, what is called effective personal leadership. Where are you going? In, de at, in December 2021, can you say to yourself that you have arrived at the destination you set in January? Well, this is how it works. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. But worse, if you don't have direction for your life, somebody else is going to co-opt you and take you to places that you never wanted to go to in the first place. Leadership also understands three important things. What to stop doing, what to start doing, and what to continue doing. Now, this is how it works. It only makes sense if you have a goal. There are things that we currently are doing that we ought to stop doing because they interfere with the realis realization of our vision and goals. So we need to identify that early in life. There are things we need to start doing. What is it that I need to start doing? Maybe talking with a smile on your face. Maybe being more approachable. To name just two things. We need to start do doing those things if I want to get to the destination I've prescribed for myself. And then there are things we need to continue doing. Things that are working, we're either going to enhance, accelerate, because they're going to take us to where we want to be. These are the four legs of important holistic leadership. Number three, is effective emotional leadership. Sorry, motivational leadership. Can somebody look at your life, is the question. Not even interact with you. And decide that I want to be like that person. Not do exactly as they do. 
not live exactly where they live, but achieve as they achieve. Are you, is, is, is our life an inspiration? In the book of life, there are, there, there's warnings and advice. We must just make sure that our lives don't end up in the, don't be like that person. The warning side. Strategic leadership. Strategic leadership. Most, well, leaders fail, in my experience, because I'm talking about at the top level now. They spend too much time working in their business when they should be working on their business. Now, if you're not working on your business, having a look at your business from a helicopter point of view, you're not going to see the wolf at the door. The threat, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So you need to get people who are going to function in your business effectively and efficiently. Are you working most in your business than on your business? That is the top leadership whom I believe are sitting amongst us here. Communication. These are in-depth programs. Let me just tell you a little thing. One of my clients in Durban owned the largest short-term investment company in Durban and surrounding area. When I met this man, he was in his late 30s, early 40s, multimillionaire. But he had reached stagnation. So I asked him, what exactly is the problem with his organization. And as every good leader would say, he said, it's my people, they're not delivering. Now, good leaders take accountability. So I said, okay, fine. It's your, what, can you, what can you do about your staff? He said, well, I don't know. I said, I can give you two suggestions. You can either fire all of them or train all of them. Anyway, I put him through what is called effective personal productivity. And in three months, his organization turned around. At that point, he was losing 375,000 rand a year, which is not sustainable. We then discovered that the problem with his organization was him. So we fixed him. He achieved his goals. One of them was to buy his, the largest, his largest competitor. Within three months, he was able to do that. Sort his personal life out, etc., et and so forth. The point I'm making is this. Unless we develop the developing capacity in ourselves, that's the technical side, we are going to fail as leadership. Let me just say this here, at this point. There's what is called competence. Now, everybody, every organization, every company is looking for competent people, but competence can be measured on three axes. Right. Skill, knowledge, and attitude. Generally in business, when people are hired, they're hired on knowledge and skill, which is the technical side. But when they're fired, they're fired on attitude because your code of conduct talks to attitude. So it's important then, as a leader, to choose people with the right attitude but who are committed to you. Okay, the temptation is, I'm committed to the organization now. The custodian of the vision of the company is always the person who had the vision. And until and unless people are committed to the leadership, however he devolves those powers, you're going to have a problem. Communication is very, very, very important. As I said earlier, when to say, what to say, how to say, and so forth. And then team, team dynamics. How do, you, how do you develop your team? I'm just looking at an interesting little thing that occurred to me while I was putting this talk together. A t a teamwork, teamwork makes the dream work. Now, I've been associated with Tyre for some time. Let me just say that. It wasn't part of my t talk. I've been associated with Tyre for some time. And I've been impressed by his 
loyalty, his dedication, and his commitment. Uh, until I met him, uh, I didn't quite believe this thing that dynamite comes in small packages. But, <laughs> but, but he's made a believer of me. Okay. I want to end there. So if, uh, all right, let's, let's talk about co competence. Unconscious incompetence. Unconscious incompetence, this is something you need to also keep in mind when you're leading people. Simply means this, people who don't know that they don't know. How do you take people from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence? Where now they know that they don't know. Because no matter what you say to them, if they don't know that they don't know, it's not going to make any sense. All right. And then from Conscious incompetence to conscious competence. Now they know that they don't know and they learn so that they know. And the fourth stage is conscious, I mean unconscious competence. That which you've repeated, you can do with your eyes closed. So I want to round off by saying this. And I can say this, Tyre, because I'm going to leave and nobody will ever find me. If you're not committed, now is a good time to get off the bus. Because the longer you stay, if you're not committed, the cost of keeping you is just too much. You owe it to yourself. Okay, it's safe. You owe it to yourself to find something that you love, that you can dedicate yourself to, that you are committed to. It is also important to be correctable, teachable. Anybody should be able to come up to you and say, you know, that thing that you did wasn't the best. Of course, it must be said respectfully. And it must be constructive. And you must be big enough. Uh, just a little story. Uh, I, I've never worked manually in my life. And there's a simple reason for it. Because there's always somebody else I can get to do that. But a couple of weeks ago, I went to help a friend. Uh, he's in the building trade. A dip, breaking down walls with a big hammer. Can you imagine that? Me, 35 years old, swinging a big hammer. <laughs> so, by accident, I broke the toilet. This guy hasn't spoken to me since. And I offered to pay for it. I offered to help him repair it. Then it occurred to me, this is the question I want to put to you as I close. Are you big enough to make mistakes and still be okay. But you've got to fix them, of course. Are you big enough to allow people around you to make mistakes and be okay with them? Of course, they must fix them. We cannot go around hammering people because they've made mistakes. The only people who don't make mistakes are dead, let me tell you. Right. I like to say this. Ladies, you'll understand this. To make an omelet, you need to break eggs. So let's go out and break eggs. I'll take this just now. Okay. Yeah. Are you taking this? Yeah, you need it? Oh, all right. Can you give um, <laughs> that a round of applause? As, as we prepare to break eggs, um, without a waste of time, uh, I will call upon uh, Advocate Manga Seten, uh, who is with the uh, Johannesburg Bar. He's going to speak to us about good corporate governance. Arm <laughs>
Um, good morning. Um, I've been asked to speak on a topic that relates to the collapse of corporate governance and the role of trade unions in curbing corruption. All told that today marks the birth of a new trade union, Public Service and Commercial Union of South Africa. I understand that the birth of, the, of PSU was deemed appropriate following an extensive analysis of the state of trade unions in various sectors in the Republic. The old adage, who guards the guardians, seem to have been influenced the genesis of the PSU, amongst others. A material vacuum has been identified in various sectors of the economy where workers are not unionized. With scores of trade unions in South Africa which employ thousands of people who represent the employees of the trade union in South Africa, let's take it further. The ruling party has thousands of employees who are not unionized. For months, they have not been paid their salaries. These workers are voiceless, and yet they are gainfully employed by the ruling party, which is the oldest liberation movement on the continent. State-owned companies, your SOEs, so, SOCs employ thousands of workers in some, and in some of the SOCs, employees are not unionized. The same applies to workers in the employ of municipal owned companies. I understand that PSU is envisaged to occupy the critical space that has always been neglected by various established unions in the country. I wish the PSU all the best as it claims its space within the trade union move environment. It should exist to change the landscape of the employment environment in the country. Now let's speak about legislation, labor legislation and corporate law. In South Africa, a trade union is registered in terms of Section 96 of the Labor Relations Act. Many trade, many trade unions have deemed it fit to also be registered in terms of the Companies Act. The implication for this dual registration is in terms of two distinct legislation is simply to ensure that the trade union complies with corporate governance amongst others. This dual registration is also crucial in ensuring that the commercial affairs of the unions are conducted in terms of established norms and standards widely recognized in the corporate world. As you know, there are penalties attached, to, attached for unions in respect of non-compliance with both the LRA and Companies Act respectively. A union cannot be run as a personal fiefdom of its founders. A union cannot be an alter ego of its founder or founders. Once established in terms of Section 96 of the LRA, it becomes a juristic person. In this regard, the union has to comply with Section 98 of the LRA in ensuring that it keeps accurate records of its income, expenditure, assets, and liabilities. The union has to be audited on an annual basis by an accredited and duly qualified auditors. It has to produce annual audited financial statements about its affairs. Section 99 of the LRA makes it plain that a union has to keep records of its membership, the minutes of its meetings, and ballot papers for a period of three years from the date of every ballot. 
Now, Section 100 of the LRA enjoins the union to provide information to the Register of the Trade Unions at the Department of Employment and Labor and on an annual basis, including its certified statements of records by its secretary, auditor's report, audited financial statements, its office bearers following elections, and its place of business. Now, in terms of Section 28 of the Companies Act, a company must keep accurate and complete accounting records, and it is an offense for a company to falsify its records or permit any person to do so. It is also an offense for company to intentionally represent its accounting records to deceive and mislead any person or fail to keep accurate or complete records other than in a prescribed form. Now, the following section, which is Section 29 of the Companies Act, places currency on the financial statements of the company and compliance is emphasized. It makes it an offense if the company's financial statements have been prepared falsely or misleading in material respects. Now, in terms of Section 22 of the Companies Act, a company must not carry on its business recklessly with gross negligence with intent to defraud any person or for any fraudulent purposes. This section is fortified by Section 77.3b of the Companies Act that states that any director of a company is liable for any loss, damages, or costs sustained by the company as a direct or indirect consequence of the, di of the director, having agreed to the carrying on of the company's business despite knowing that it was being conducted in a manner prohibited by Section 22 or 22 one of the Act or being part to an act or omission by the company despite knowing that the act or omission was calculated to defraud a company's creditor, employee, or shareholders, or had other or another fraudulent purpose. Now, in sum, to establish a union is a huge responsibility. It is not your ma your passe plus. It requires intellectual capital that is not allergic to reading and engaging in daily complex problems and debates encountered by workers on the ground. A modern trade union in South Africa should always endeavor to educationally capacitate its members. The quality of union membership is also crucial. Because if union is peopled with persons with various skills, that should serve as scouts to identify corruption, malfeasance practices at workplaces and devise strategies to drastically destroy the cancer and its remnants. Now, coming to the collapse of good corporate governance in South Africa, we have witnessed the collapse of good corporate governance in various forms and shapes. One of the notable forms and shapes was the resolution passed in December 2007 during the 52nd ANC conference in Polokwane Limpopo. The said resolution sponsored the disestablishment of Scorpions. Following the param parliamentary process, indeed the Scorpion's fate was sealed. What followed was the weak South African Police Service, its crime intelligence, crime detection capacity and the likes. And please uh, pardon my cross-examination of the National Commissioner a few weeks ago. I was simply doing my job. South African revenue services was not spared. SOCs such as Transnet, Escom, Prasa, 
SAA, SABC, Dinel et al. became the epicenters of corruption and malfeasance. Appointments to the boards of the SOEs were the legislative function mortgaged or outsourced to people of no particular origin to borrow from the late Hugh Masekela's lyrics in his famous song that details the hardships of workers, Stimela. The SOCs became personal fiefdoms of certain persons who had powers not sourced in the supreme law of the land or any other relevant law. I can simply call these persons the pharaohs. In other quarters, these pharaohs have been called or likened to Imikodoi. The ruthlessness of these pharaohs was to ensure that their disciples execute their instructions impeccably to the detriment of the poor, but more to the mutilation of the economy of the republic. I can assure you if those pharaohs were around today and they met someone who would have been corrupt in the name of Professor Mdwaba, I can tell you all strategies were going to be devised to ensure that Mr. M Professor Mdaba ascends as the first director of the International Labour Organization. But because he's not corrupt, we sing a different dance. Through the Commission on State Capture chaired by Deputy Chief Justice Zondo, we all know that, that the disciples of the pharaohs were some of the elected representatives appointed to powerful offices of authority. Startling but not strange. The disciples needed agents to execute the instructions of the pharaohs. Such was executed with impunity. All government departments were not immune from this pharaonic cancer. The corporate world was not spared. Auditing companies whose fame and integrity were not blemished hang their images in shame as they too admitted to have falsified companies' records and doctored audit results and annual financial statements. Auditing firms, firms were also in bed with the pharaohs because they audited the books of the pharaohs or the companies owned by the pharaohs. Mutual banks and pension funds whose raison d'etre were to ensure that the hard-earned cash of the poor accrues interest to enable them to educate their children and build themselves a better future, were looted in what was termed the great bank heist and the Steinhoff's massive corruption. Impunity reigned supreme. The sitting president at the time will frequent the compound of the pharaohs. His ministers will follow suit. Chairpersons and board members of the SOCs would follow the same modus operandi. It was the worst of times in the life of the South African constitutional democracy. We owe it to the investigative journalists who, from various media houses that today our eyes have become opened to the scourge of grand corruption, that has walked Mandela's land. Who unto those who held unwarranted in insults to the fourth estate? For without the fourth estate, the bankruptcy of the Republic would have been far worse than it is at this present moment. But what should the role of a trade union be in curbing corruption? Trade unions have a powerful instrument to fight corruption in the SOCs and in the corporate South Africa. The New Companies Act is one of the sharpest instruments available to fight corruption at the disposal of the trade unions. As we know from the period during the Pharaoh's reigns, the trade unions elected to do nothing. Trade unions if they had the political will, ought to have taken the previous 
directors or board members of the SOCs to court to have them declared delinquent directors. At Transnet, Prasa, SABC, SAA, Dinel, Eskom, et al., there were unions that witnessed unprecedented levels of corruption. They did nothing tangible. In terms of Section 16234 of the Companies Act, the following parties are entitled to bring an application to have the court to declare a person a delinquent director, and these are a company itself, a shareholder, a director, company secretary or prescribed officer of the company, a registered trade union that represents employees of the company, or another representative of the employees of a company. The company's an intellectual property commission or the takeover regulation panel in terms of section 1623. And an organ of state responsible for the administration of any legislation. So all these parties described in section 162 of the Companies Act did nothing. To this day, previous board members of the SOCs have acted to advance the interest of the pharaohs, have not been declared delinquent directors. They remain directors of other companies in the Republic. No organ of state such as the National Treasury has salvaged the situation. Now the birth of the PSU comes after the West winter that has sounded the Republic during the Pharaoh's reign. The, PS, the PSCU owes it not only to its members to ensure that justice is done, but to every grain of sand of this land and the generations to come. Other established unions cannot do this civic duty, for the majority are aligned to the ruling party. In conclusion, there is a surah in the Quran, Surah El Rad, in, in English is translated as thunder. And its chapter, it, it's, it's verse 11, states the following. Very lie, Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change that which is in themselves. Members of the PSCU must be fearless. They must be in love with the hatred of injustice, corruption, malfeasance, nepotism, sexual harassment, gender-based violence, racism, discrimination, and bribery of any form from the employer. They must, be f they must fearlessly fight for employment conditions that are favorable to all. They must remember that we have malfunctioning municipalities, which are hotbeds of corruption. Ethics and ethical leadership must be the non-negotiable essentials expected out of the leadership of the PSU. May Allah bless the PSU. Uh, can we give him a round of applause again? Okay, we are going to move fast. Uh, I don't know whether you are aware of what is happening here. We started with leadership. Now we are going to governance. Can you see the relationship? Because of uh, leadership depends on governance. And governance depends on leadership. So on that note, without a waste of time, and Tahir, you listen to this one. Um, I'm calling ILO Director General. I'm removing the candidate. <laughs> Prof. Dawa, can you grace us? Can you grace us?
We are still waiting for those guys not coming. Is it? Yeah. Okay, so, so we'll find a way to make it work. Do I have my presentation though? Is it going to show or? Okay, good morning. I had asked for a mic that gives me some freedom, but if it doesn't, um, if it's a problem, I will make this work. I just hate standing behind podiums, not only because of my height, but also because I like to be liberated. Um, so many years ago, it was quite interesting. I thought a way of starting this is to share with you um, about 2002 when I had bought into a company that had many millions of losses to, to turn it around. Um, somebody came to see me that I've actually, I've been thinking a lot about this person. I need to find him. I hope he's still around. He asked to see me and came to my office. Um, I have a rule that I see everybody until I decide that maybe they are wasting my time and I'm wasting their time. So my PA was worried. He said, why are you meeting this guy? I said, I don't know. He wants to see me, so let's see him. So the guy came and he told me he wanted to recruit me for the Black Information Technology Forum at the time, which was an organization that was there for black practitioners in IT. And I said, why? Because I just started with my company, Talk IT, and it was in big, big trouble. And he said, because we are trying to recruit as many revolutionaries as possible. So I said, I think you're confused. I come from the rural villages. My only touch with revolutionarism is that I studied industrial sociology and I measured in industrial sociology. I majored with, uh, on Karl Marx, amongst many other things. But I don't think that qualifies me to be a revolutionary. So his response was, maybe you need to leave that to us. We'll identify revolutionaries. Will you come now that we've identified you? So that was sort of my start of my life in organized anything outside uh, serial entrepreneurism because coming from where I came from as Lalini, there was no such a thing as uh, being involved in anything organized other than your little community, little things and, and so on. And also the fact that my family had come from a strong Poco uh, PAC background and I always knew what they felt about many things and and my father, when he passed on 13 years ago, one of the things he told me, he says, you know, I warned you about this ANC of yours. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that um, since. So I thought maybe that's a good place to start. Um, wish you well for the launch of the PSCU. Um, may it uh, gather the momentum it requires to do the things that need to be done. And because I'm always forward, you'll also forgive me. I don't know what's happened to my... I thought I brought it here. I think the MC took it, yes. <laughs> I, I brought it here for a reason, thank you. So because I'm always forward, so I checked at your, obje at your objects uh, of your union. And whilst I'm sure a lot of things are covered and there's lawyers that are better than me than ad as advocate uh, uh, Smanga is here. But I thought it's just something to point out. It might not be a, an issue. But I want to point it out nevertheless, then I feel that it's out of, it's, it's left me. Um, and I mean, y this can be covered anywhere on your objects. Maybe it is there, but it might not be a bad idea to think about promoting things relating to occupational safety and health, even if you are going to be the banking, so banking sector. Because if you've looked at the COVID, you would have seen that um, the biggest enemy of the workers during the COVID has been mental health. Mental health is a killer. That's always been there, but we've just never had the bravery to accept it, especially men. <laughs> you know, it's not a good thing to say, I've got a mental health problem. Um, and recently I have a younger brother who was the CEO of Workday, a very big enterprise resource planning company um, competing with the likes of uh, Oracle and so on, who was 
very concerned that he how he would tell us as a family that he's decided he needs to take time out for mental wellness and his company is doing exceptionally well he launched the company here and I encourage him to take time out. So for me, it's become a very big, big matter, and I don't want to digress, but I, want, I wanted to just mention it to you because, you know, if you look at the conventions that relate to occupational health, um, the, whether it's the promotional, promotional framework, which is Convention 187, or the one on the actual occupational safety and health uh, elements, Convention 155, or for that matter, if you look at uh, the services, the health services that are required at enterprise level, Convention 161, it may be something worth thinking about. Now, let me go into my presentation. Um, I want to confirm as well, con colleagues, that I was given 30 minutes. I see it's 25, but I can tailor it to 25. I'll just go fast when I get to some slides. The... I want to thank uh, the, the words mentioned by Tahir earlier on, by the facilitator just now about uh, these issues political of the ILO. Um, the only thing I'd like to say to you is that I'm going to win. <clears throat> I have every intention of winning, and it will happen. So people can do what they have to do. Um, I think it's a free world. Um, people can conspire, as they always do. People can go and um, make up things, as they always do. But when your mind is not imprisoned by another human being, no one can stop you. As I always tell my kids, I always say to them, there's no army that can fight an idea whose time has come. That's by Victor Hugo. So we will do this. Uh, we will have our first African party at the ILO next year, for sure. Um, and it will be a noisy one, um, as we are accustomed to do, and as we are known to do as Africans. We need drums and all kinds of things. But on matters future of work, um, if we could change the slide and go to the, yes, that one, the, the pre-COVID situation. So it was interesting to listen to Mr. Dawson <laughs> earlier on. So, he, um, and it was good, though, because it linked to some of the points I'm going to be making. Um, because I thought it's one thing to talk about the future of work, and everybody talks about the future of work, but the future of work <laughs> has been with us for a while. It's, it's, it's actually become a mockery of this uh, use of the word future because it's not waiting for us to sort of jump in through windows or, or go through doors. It's been happening for a very long time. And I like to tell stories, and my, my youngest child, who just qualified as a psychologist, um, Nina, my daughter, a few days ago, she always says, Daddy, I worry when you speak because you keep going into stories that I never know if you're going to come back. Uh, and I, I sit and I get tense and I think, did he, did he, does he remember he must come back to where he was? <laughs> and so you'll forgive me, I like to do that. Stories for me are the best way of, 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 of talking and sharing a message. So some of you will be aware that the president, um, sorry that he tested COVID, tested positive for COVID, I hear, in 2017, I worked with a team, led that team for the president to chair the Global Commission on the Future of Work in, in Geneva. I worked very hard for this as a patriot of this country. It didn't have to be him, by the way. It could have been anybody. I could have got anyone to chair. Anyone. But I worked hard to get him to chair as my president. Not for him. I wasn't doing it for him. I was doing it for my country. And this is the confusion people make. That I have, no, I have no time for him. He's my president. And when he acts good, I'll call him president. When he doesn't, I'll tell him, you're messing up. And he then chaired. Um, and it was a very interesting situation because I struggled to the previous minister, Oliphant, found a way to push me into his protocol so that I could brief him. It was quite interesting. So the whole world at the centenary celebration and the global commission was looking for me. 
and I'm, and I'm serious calling this the whole world, because I, I led organizations in over 150 countries, right? So here's little me in Geneva. The whole world says, when are you coming? And I'm saying, I'm just wanting to brief my president. Yes, but we have all the, yes, just brief my president. So, and he doesn't know this. This is the, the, the difficulty with lack of leadership. Because he hasn't given himself time to understand what it is he's coming to do. He hasn't given himself time, just a little bit of time, just to understand what are you doing here. So eventually I go in and I present to him for 10 minutes and he's falling asleep. I don't know if it was jet lag or whatever, you know, shame presidents are busy people. And so ultimately I find it in me to say to him, Mr. President, if at any stage during the Global Commission on the Future of Work discussions, you think that I'm a bit unresponsive to you, because he would be chairing and I would be one of the 28, but I don't think he's done any research as to why I'm there in the 28. This is the problem with the people who purport to lead us, right? He's given himself no time to check. So I say to him, if this happens, Mr. President, call me outside. Because I will not move. So he looks at me and everybody around him, and this, this lady who was the ambassador of the Nozipom Kagato Diseko, who was ill-treating workers as well in Geneva who, by the way, is the person I've discovered has withdrawn my support, well, submitted the papers for me not to be supported. Nozipom Klagato Disego at Deco is the one who acted on behalf of everybody. So they're all sitting there. So we go and we start the Global Commission on the Future of Work conversations, and then things get stuck. And the president, everybody around the table tries, understands the point I'm making, but the current DG of the ILO, who's sitting opposite me with the president, table of 28, keeps whispering in the president's ear. And I look at him and I'm thinking, he's poisoning him. And the president's just not being able to look at me. You know, you know when a guy has, does, can't look at you, his eyes are going everywhere but at you. And in that room, there were only four of us who had support, who had people assisting us. Four. Him, the current DG of the ILO, the leader of the governments, Claudio de la Puente, um, the leader of the trade unions, um, um, Luke Quarterback, sorry, five, and me, not four. So he rules on the point that I'm trying to say to him he mustn't rule on. And he rules on it. And I've got my hand up. So then there's pandemonium. So my people send me WhatsApp groups to say, boss, what just happened? <laughs> Why is your president doing this? Now, you can imagine this is my president. And this guy whispering in his ear knows this is my president because some people are very smart, you know. He knows that if it was him, I would deal with him very quickly. But because he's my president, uh, I need to, you know, be a little bit of a ballerina. Fast forward to what happens. He then ignores me, my president, until Christine Scotland from Norway, when he calls her to speak, says, no, Mr. President, uh, I'd like Mtunzi to speak first. So he says, no, I'm going to go to him. So he says, well, I'll wait. So then he goes to Mr. Singh from India. Mr. Singh says, no, I'll wait for Mtunzi to speak. See, this is a problem of not doing your homework, <laughs> right? Because he doesn't realize in that room that nobody in my group can speak until I've spoken. This is the element of humility that lacks in people. So now I'm in a catch-22. I'm looking at my president. I'm thinking, I can't emasculate my president. But I can't agree to what he's done. <laughs> So eventually, he finds it in him to ask me to speak. So I say to him, Chair, you've ruled. 
And because you've ruled, I have to respect your ruling. I am, however, completely in disagreement with your, the content of your ruling, which puts me in a very difficult position. So I'm going to ask that when the report of the Global Commission comes out for the celebration of the ILO, because this was supposed to be the bedrock of the celebration of the ILO, which resulted in a centenary declaration that you can find now on the ILO's website. So, but I'm going to ask that it be marked in that report that I, Mtunzi Mduaba, am very opposed to this point with an asterisk. He then panics. So then I see his face, you know? And then everybody goes, yeah, but can we do that? So I said, well, I don't know, but I want it done for me. Because I can't agree to this. If I agree to this, I speak for over 50 million companies with over 400 million workers. I couldn't do it in good conscience. I'm not doing things for show. I'm doing things for impact because they can work. And this is the problem, that people do things for show, not because of the content and the impact. So the president asked for a break. So I thought, ah, maybe he's going to now finally remember. He's remembered. He must speak to me. He never spoke to me. He went and spoke to his people and then came into the room walking with Prime Minister Stefan Löfven of Sweden, who was co-chairing with him. In between, what had happened is that a professor from Italy came to me and said to me, what if you and the other officers of the governing body don't sign the report, which is much worse than what I was asking for. So I said, and by the way, I already had a mandate from my group not to sign, but they were too scared. They thought I would never not sign because this is like a document that's going to go for posterity. You know, your great ch grandchildren and your great grandchildren can read that one upon a time you were there and your signature is there. First time in 100 years of the ILO since 1919. So I said to my team, actually, I think it's a good idea. I don't think I'm going to sign this document. Fast forward. I tell his spokesperson. So the president walks in, and when he walks in, he says, <clears throat> I hear there's a solution to the problem Tunzi raised before we left for the break. So I look at him, and I must confess, at that moment, I lost all respect for the man. At that moment. Because at that moment, I realized he was way, way out of his league. He didn't understand what just happened. What did he not understand? He failed to understand that the ILO is a tripartite body. He failed to understand that everything in the ILO works on the basis of social dialogue. And this is the guy who was a trade unionist. He did not grasp it. And this is the basic 101 of the ILO is tripartism. Three, it will not work without trade unions, governments, and employers. And all three officers, Claudio de la Puente, Luke, Cotterberg, and myself, were now not going to sign this report. What did it mean? It meant that that report cannot go into the ILO as an authoritative report anymore. It meant that the work we'd done for a year and a half was rendered useless by one single stroke of a president failing to call him, break for 10 minutes, and speaking to me for 10 minutes. And when I told his team, this Kusela young lady, I said, Kusela, something very bad just happened here. You need to tell the president, before we come to launch this global report in January, this was November, it was his birthday that day, in fact, the president. Before we come back to launch this report, make it a point that I have a conversation with the president in South Africa at home. It never happened. The next time we met, we were launching the report. So as you can imagine, so he's going to launch this report. There's five people that are going to speak to the world. And I'm carrying two speeches. One, hoping the president is not going to say a word about this thing that he ruled on that he should never have. And the other one is if he does. So he did. And so I made my second speech. Now I hear he's upset with me. And one of the things he said when they decided to withdraw, that he doesn't know that I know, was said in cabinet, was that 
when other ministers were saying, why don't you call this Mtunzi guy? Why don't you call him? Because, you know, my own minister attacked me in the cabinet, just so you know. So he went with a cabinet memo, and he went for me. The other ministers were shocked. <laughs> he said, well, how is it possible that your custodian minister is the one that attacks you? Because he's supposed to sell you. But anyway, to cut a long story short, the president, it is alleged, I don't have proof, it is alleged, said, this man was with me at the Global Commission on the Future of Work. He is anti-worker. He is anti-worker, he called me. And therefore, we cannot support him. Now, on this note, I then, why I appreciated what Mr. Dawson was talking about is this issue of leadership. So I thought, if I'm going to talk about the future of work, I can't talk about the future of work without touching on issues of leadership or lack thereof. Because this is the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is that in the pre-COVID situation, we had attitudinal change-related issues as a people. We had leadership and implementation issues in South Africa and, and many places in the world. Flawed economic structures, flawed reality, therefore, that we operate on. And we're scratching what I refer to as the informality surface. Because you, if you look at our economies in the developing world, we're using models that are foreign to us. And yet we hope to get an outcome that's going to be a solution for us. It's impossible. When you look at South Africa that has a 65% informality, or you look at Colombia in, in Latin America that has 65% informality, Guatemala, 70% informality, India, 90% informality, Nigeria, 90% informality. There is no way you can solve our problems by using the formal sector rules in informality. And then what do we say in the ILO? We say, we will transition people from informality to formality. Sounds good. Sounds good. Good rhetoric. But how do you transition 90% into 10%? How, how do you propose to do that? And how do you transition 65% of South African informality to the 35 that is JSE-based, white-owned, hugely, hugely monopolistic in its frame. How do you do that? So as we move forward, we need to grapple with these issues. There's a lack of appreciation for what productivity means. You, you mentioned productivity, and I put in there Kai and Zen, because Kai Zen means improvement every day, continuous improvement. And I can't think of anybody that doesn't want to improve every day. I'm sorry, I can't find anyone. I think I want to improve every day. That's for sure. And if anybody doesn't want to improve every day, then something is grossly wrong. And we need to address why. Why would you not want to improve? What's the problem? And so productivity and Kaizen is never understood. If you could change the slide for me. So then I thought, if we're going to talk about future of work, we can't do that without talking about a just transition and the future of work. And a just transition, if you look just at a simple, simple dictionary explanation, is a vision-led, unifying, and place-based set of principles, processes, and practices that build economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, approaching production and consumption cycles holistically and waste-free. The principle of a just transition, then, is that a healthy economy and a clean environment can and should coexist. But we can never do this. Because for us, right now, at 32% levels of unemployment, there's nothing to transition from. What are we transitioning from? To transition to something else. So we're in a mess. So how do you transition from the mess we are? We can only transition if we have awareness, as you said, sir. So if you know what you don't know, which is my favorite expression, by the way, so it was quite interesting that you use it. If you, don't, if you don't know what you don't know, it's impossible to have a just transition. You can't, because what are you moving from? What are you doing now, right? And you could change the slide for me. So when you talk about the just transition and the future of work, I suggest we have a look at this centenary declaration that I spoke about, which, by the way, 
ended up not recognizing the Global Commission Future of Work report because the president still doesn't understand that he messed it up. He still has no clue that he single-handedly messed it up. And I had to sit there as a South African and look at him and think, my God, what is he doing? Right? So what did we end up doing? We ended up calling the report one of the reference documents to the ILO, to the ILC, said because we couldn't call it an authoritative document because the constituencies have not agreed to it. But you will see there, I see on the agenda, we've got something on gender violence. That photo was taken just after the completion of Convention 190, which we also did at the same time as the Centenary Declaration. Convention 190, you will know, is violence and harassment. It's just been ratified by South Africa and, and, and taken into our law. And the lady with the hand up is a trade unionist from Canada, Mary Clark Walker, was a very good friend of mine, me, the anti worker Very, very good friend of mine. Okay? Speak to her on WhatsApp all the time, <laughs> this lady. And this photo, when it was taken, is quite interesting because behind her is Pasquier, Kathleen Pasquier, who's the leader of the workers, who absolutely hates me, and we, can't, we don't have time to go into that. But, but this photo is a very interesting photo because the employers that I led were so unhappy with me dancing on the stage because they didn't like some of the conclusions. My people were nervous for me. They said, how can you dance like that? You know some of our employers are not happy with this. I said, that's their problem. This is social dialogue. We dialogued. We came with conclusions. Some people are going to be happy. Some are going to be unhappy. Ultimately, that's what tripartism is about, right? You don't live with what you came with. <laughs> you live with what everybody agreed to. That's as simple as all that. So you'll see from that that the declaration talks about increasing investment in people's capabilities, increasing investment in the institutions of work, increasing investment in decent and sustainable work, and the declaration then calls on all its 187 member states to ensure all people benefit from the changing world of work, the continued relevance of the employment relationship, adequate protection for all workers and promote sustained, inclusive and sustainable economy growth and full employment and decent work. If you could change the slide. I also thought it would be good to give you the SDGs. All of you, I'm sure, work with SDGs every day. Some of us do it unconsciously so. But the thing about the SDGs that I always try and make sure that wherever I go, one stresses it, is that even though in our sector, we have to work with SDG 8, right? It's decent work and economic activity. That's what we work with in our sector. But you need to always constantly remember that all SDGs, all 17 of them are connected. You will not be able to resolve anything if you only work on eight. So whilst we are working on eight in our space, we need to be helping other people work on theirs in their space, right? Because if you look at, for example, SDG 1, SDG 1 talks about no poverty. So if you're going to do eight, but you're not going to do one. How are you going to make things happen? Because it's not possible that you could do that. So, and if you look at two, which is talking about zero hunger, how do you do that? So it's always got to be connected. Change slide. So leadership required to tackle global challenges and just transitions. For me, I ask the question to which I'm sure we know the answer. Is it possible to have a just transition without leadership? The answer is a resounding no. Does style of leadership matter? Does impact consciousness matter? Of course. Of course. But we're surrounded by a lot of people who are in positions of authority, not leadership. And people confuse authority with leadership. And they think by virtue of you occupying an authoritative position, you're a leader. Nonsense. Absolute bull. Because all of us are so involved in who we are. I get so sick of it. That everybody is so convinced, you know, you need to say, look at the prefix before the name. Who cares? Why are we so besotted 
with who we are rather than what we do or should be doing? Why are we not doing what we're supposed to do? Whatever happened to content? Whatever happened to impact? Whatever happened to social justice? Why is it that you must worry first that, oh, Mtunzi wants to be called professor. If you don't call him professor, that's the end of He's not coming. What? Why? You know, I mean, it's actually funny. My family had to beg me to use this professor thing because I was embarrassed. And it was a funeral. And my little brother said to me, when are you going to use this professor? I said, why? He says, no, we could get some respect here. <laughs> he says, look, they don't respect us. You know, if you put professor there, you're going to see, they're going to move. You know, I mean, and, and, and this is true. We laugh, but it's true. It's true. And which goes to the point that I've got there. Um, when, can it happen when there's dietyship and psychophants? Now, dietyship is the creation of gods. It's exactly what we do. We, we also participate in this authority rubbish. Because what do we do? We start by going, uh, leadership, leadership, <laughs> leadership. What is he led? <laughs> what did this person lead? Why, why is it leadership? Did he, did you know people he's led and he's led them to what? Right? And as soon as a guy becomes a minister, to us, oh, minister. I used to sell leather jackets to the guy. <laughs> I used to sell leather jackets to him at Shell House. And Jackie Celebi and all of them. They used to buy leather jackets from me. I was a student at Vets. And all of a sudden now he's a minister. He thinks he's a different guy. Well, to me he's the same guy. Hopefully who's grown, but I've found out he's gone backwards over the years. He hasn't grown at all. He gets upset. He's got a huge ego. He, you know, he, he, wants to he wants to tell me, I must change my annual report forward. Because he says it sounds like a manifesto. At Productivity SA. He says, no, sounds like a manifesto. You, you are condemning my government. I said, but you appointed me chair of Productivity SA. It's a tripartite board. I've got trade unions there. They agree with me. They empowered me to say what I'm saying. They told me to say it. So why am I the one who's coming with the manifesto? Why don't you blame them? They're my bosses. They're my board. Right? So in all of that, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. I think, that, I think you're right. Yeah, you do the score. So, so I'm going to, you'll get this presentation. So I'll just go straight to some of the things um, that are far, far more important. So productivity, I'm going to leave now. Mr. Dawson helped us with that. Um, self of, se sense of self-importance. I've talked about in passing. Labeling. There is nothing as disabling and labeling. Do you know how people disable you? I hear that Tulas goes around calling me arrogant. That's disabling me, you see. Because once he says I'm arrogant, I'm going to say, ah, you know, and be defensive. <laughs> you see, then, then he's finished me. I can't speak again. But he doesn't realize that by telling me to change my annual report, my forward, as the chair of productivity, I say, that's arrogance. But when I respond to him and I say to him, Minister, you seem to think you can monopolize patriotism. That's what I said to him, by the way, for the record. That's why he's upset. I said, no, you can't monopolize patriotism. I'm a patriot too. We just do it differently. Right? So you can't, you're not the standard. <laughs> on what patriotism is. You can dictate it to me when I'm trying to share collectively what I think we should, you know, respect. And you know, I write respect, respect, and South Africanisms, apartheid, colonialism, and elitism, I think finished us. Because the one thing about South Africans is lack of respect for each other. I think the day we wake up and smell the coffee and realize that respecting each other will take us to the next level, you can forget about this future of work nonsense. I can assure you, you can forget about it because we have no respect for each other. The whole world respects us, by the way. The whole world. Everywhere South Africans go are seen as people who have a good work ethic, who can lead. I meet them all the time. All over the world I've met amazing South Africans. Until you get home. <laughs> when you get to the airport, you must tone down. <laughs> I tell you, it is like trauma. I'm happy my daughter is a psychologist. You get to the airport and you say, you know what? You're South Africa now. Whatever you think you know, keep it quiet. Don't share it with nobody. It's going to get you into trouble. Right? Next slide. What is productivity? I'm going to leave that. What is productivity? Again, I'm going to leave that. Sentinel iteration, I'll leave that too because you'll read the sentinel iteration and you'll read um, 
I've said some of the things. I've talked about the SDGs. I think it's just important to know that the SDGs for 2030, well, I'm supposed we know they're not going to happen, right? Yeah, so no matter what we are told. So the guys will tell us stories, but they're not going to happen because pre-COVID, we were looking like the whole world is going to achieve three out of 17, right? But during the COVID, it looks like we might achieve only one. And it's definitely not eight. It's not economic activity and decent work, so you can rest assured. So until we change the world, until we disrupt the world and show that pre-COVID we had a flawed situation that has been exposed, that we need to change in terms of the economic structure and everything, it ain't going to happen. And for us to be able to make it happen, we need $1.3 trillion per year in Africa. At this point in time, we are under $50 billion a year. Yes, under $50 billion dollars. We need 1.3 trillion. So how are you going to how are you going to get your SDGs? It's not possible. So let's let's rather have a reality check, get depressed, get treated, and then we know we can work on it, right? And then in terms of the future of work, I identified some mega trends. I think that would be slide 13. If you can move, um, it says future of work mega trends. I think it's the one after this one. I thought it was just important to identify something you already know technological advances, changing demographics, climate change, globalization, these are huge. And, and the globalization thing is actually quite funny. So the guy who's coined um, the industrial, what? Fourth Industrial Revolution. What's his name? Uh, from the, future, the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab. So at the centenary declaration, we're at a cocktail, and he's going on and on and on. I mean, I don't know why it's a big deal that he's coined the Fourth Industrial Revolution as a title, but maybe it's good. So he's now telling us, yeah, we need to manage the transition and make sure that globalization is equal. So I, me, after a while, I say, I raise my hand. I say, sorry, I don't understand. How do we manage this transition you're talking about? He says, no, you know, you, 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 you make sure that people are okay from one platform to the other. I said, yes, but can you explain it to me in such a way that my 81-year-old mother in the rural villages understands? How am I going to do it? And the thing that he really failed to understand, and of course my colleagues pulled me by the jacket to say, please leave him alone, it's okay. You know, he's our guest of honor, you know. Sure. Yes, <laughs> he's our guest of honor, so he can say any rubbish he likes, right? So I said, you know, the problem for me is that I don't care about the fourth industrial revolution. I really don't. I don't give, a, I don't care. I don't care about the fifth and the sixth. What I care about is decent work and economic activity. What I care about is dignity to people. I need for us to be able to say, in managing this transition, whether it's through skilling or upskilling or reskilling or, or doing whatever it is we're doing to manage the transition, that we're going to handhold our people from one platform to the next so that they get to the next platform with dignity of being able to create work or have work. That is all people want to hear. They don't want to hear fourth or fifth or sixth and people write theses on the fourth and the fifth, but what does it do at the end of the day, right? But anyway, be that as it may, again, you'll see that the emphasis there for me is the COVID-19 has exposed structural issues, pre-existing flaws, which we must deal with. The next slide. So now I think I've got one minute or maybe almost zero. So the way we organize our work becomes important. The employment status of workers, the definition of an employer, the definition of a worker are very different. You know, the Finnish prime minister, who's I think 29 years old or 30 years old, she said something about a year, yeah, 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 and a half, yeah, and a half ago. And everybody nearly killed her. I'm not quite, I'm still trying to figure why. She said, why is it that it's gospel that the working day must be eight hours? And that the working week must be five days. She says, where did this come from? She says, it came from the ILO. In 1919, by the way, in case people have forgotten. The ILO set the eight-hour day in 1919. Because workers mobilized against capital at the time. That there needed to be set hours. Structured hours. For us to be able to do things. So why is it, pre-COVID, why would people then not say, well, maybe... It doesn't need to be eight hours anymore because my daughter, the one who just qualified as a psychologist, she says, Daddy, why must I work for eight hours? Why can't I work for two if I can do what I can do in eight hours? And why can't I go do yoga one, one of the days in the week? What, what's the big deal? 
who cares as long as I deliver what I'm supposed to deliver. This was pre-COVID, right? So this lady, the Finnish prime minister said, why can't it be four days? Why can't we attend to our families and ourselves as long as we are productive? <laughs> as long as we are productive, total factor productivity. I'm not talking here labor productivity, by the way, just so that we're not confused. I'm not talking capital productivity. I'm talking total factor productivity. If we are productive, does it matter how many days or hours we've worked? Surely not. The COVID has proved it. So did we need a COVID? Whether you believe in conspiracy theories of how the COVID has happened or whether it's happened naturally, the fact of the matter is it's shifted the needle. It showed everybody what is possible, which we were saying is not possible before, that you could work from home. So where is the workplace today? Where is it? Is it in my house? Is it here? Is it in my car? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares where it is? As long as we do work, as long as we are protective, as long as our economies are working, as long as we have dignity and we can take our kids to school and pay for the things they need, right? And all of a sudden now, people are realizing, my God, maybe it's possible. But of course it's possible. But it's amazing that human beings need calamity to understand what's possible, to see what's possible. And this is why there's a lot of people conspiring that I don't become the ILODG, by the way. Because... I don't do well with nonsense and rubbish. I don't do well with people's importance. I don't. I'm sorry, and it's too late now. I'm too old. I'm a grandfather of two kids, two grandchildren. I'm not going to change that. But I'll keep the process of consultation. I'll keep the process of social dialogue. I'll keep, like, Tahir was there. Tahir, by the way, is in my team. I don't know if you're aware. Tahir, but Tahir is one of the troublemakers. He's part of my campaign. So, so, so when I addressed IMEC which is the industrial market economy countries, they say to me, you know, because this is the thing they like to throw at me, yeah, so they're the Americans and they're British and the Canadians agreed immediately after that, if you remember Tahir. They said, so as an employer leader, you used to talk about global supply chains in a different way. How are you going to talk about them now? So I said to them, well, I think you're asking the wrong question. The question you should be asking is what mandate are you going to give me as my governing body in the ILO, as the tripartite. What mandate are you going to give me? What do you want me to do? I had a mandate, yes, as the leader of employers, and I was good at it. And that's why people are upset, right? But if you can shift that and accept that now I need a mandate from you as your DG, I can just still be as good at it. Just tell me what it is you want for the world, and we'll do it. And I think these are the things we need to be alive to. My time, the facilitator, is really, really nervous now. So I'm going to have to take off. Yeah, I can see. I feel for him. I'm really feeling bad. So, so please go through all the slides at your own time and see. And you can go straight to the last slide that says thank you. And you can share the slides by yourselves. But I think whatever happens, congratulations for making this big step with the PSCU. May it really, really cause trouble, as much trouble as you possibly can cause. And as the DG of the ILO, thanks to you, Mr. Facilitator, you have a friend. <laughs> I'm going to stay here. But the, the facilitator no, no, no. is the boss. No, no, no. Oh, on psychophants. Okay, so it was on that slide on dietitian and psychophants. I didn't spend too much time on it. Um, that slide is basically like this. So the way psychophantism works, it works on the basis of me, for example, as the DG ILO, DG next year, keeping all the people that will never say no to me. Yeah, so I surround myself with all the people that will say, Mtunzi, you're the greatest human being ever. Every morning, that's all they say. You're the amazing. Every morning. Can't believe I have a guy like this leading me. Wow. That is psychophantism. Is that, is that enough? There's no, there's no, growth no. There'll never be any growth. Nothing will happen there. No sustainability, no resilience. Thank you. Uh, uh, let's give him a, another round of applause. Uh, uh, our our DG. 
I think colleagues, comrades, uh, PSCU, uh, Tahir and the team, Barry Lilo, Boma, the ship which you are leading. Anyway, I think when we, again, I'm taking you through another process. The first speaker, second speaker, third speaker, everything which they said is encapsulated in this word integrity. And people tend to reduce integrity to mere being moral. But integrity is about integration, is to see the whole ecosystem. That if I take a wrong decision here, integrity, it says, how is it going to affect me downstream? And sometimes we think being moral qualifies one to be a leader. You can be moral as much as you can, but if you don't have qualities of a leader, you don't have them. So integrity, it says to us, whatever you do, think downstream, 10 steps, the consequences of what you've done. How does it affect the whole ecosystem? Because of everything which they said, including Tahir, it's about the ecosystem. When one part of the ecosystem collapses, it has the consequences to the whole spectrum. Then it follows that. All of us, we have an embedded responsibility to make sure that we understand the impact of our decision. There is no such a thing that is my life. Because of when you go through pain, Everyone around you gets affected. On that note, I just want us collectively to just give all of them a round of applause, our speakers. All right. You see, any business, it has its core. So the core business of the day is this part of the resol resolutions for adoption. Now, uh, the person who's going to do it is Nkazimula Moyeni, who is a corporate lawyer, who will grace us. On, on that note, let us give him a round of applause. <laughs> and as he is ascending, um, a prof, uh, your slides. You know, we have a tendency, ne? of, you know, reading through the stuff. And I just want to challenge all of us, and including Tahir. After this, I think we need a session, if it's not a workshop, to go through it, to process the information which is here. And transform it into knowledge, and process it further so that it can be intelligence. Then we can work with it. Because we have a lot of information, we don't have knowledge, we don't have intelligence. So we are going to process it. And I think if we need more information, we'll also consult you. Amanda! Uh, uh, thank you very much. Good, uh, is it morning or afternoon? Oh, morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ngazum Lomoyeni. I've been tasked to deal with the serious stuff. Yeah. Uh, basically, the whole, um, one of the key fundamental uh, purposes of a conference is what we are about to do now, which is the adoption of the resolutions, which will basically be the core um, uh, membership and the core people who will be running the PSU, this union that we are establishing today. So I'll, I'll, I'm tasked with uh, going through t four uh, resolutions. The one will be the adoption of the constitution. The other one is the election of the NEC. 
Uh, the other one will be the election of the auditor. And uh, the last one, uh, I'll confirm. What's the last one, Major? Yeah, just three. That will be the three. Uh, basically, the first one that I wanted us to go through before um, we, we, we adopt it is just a key explanation. I, they've touched on the fact that I'm, I have some low, uh, uh, the legal exp I'm a legal expert in a way. So I like to deal with the legal stuff. At least advocate is not here to check. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to call me out. But basically, um, the the Labor Relations Act, right? The Labor Relations Act adopted what we know as guidelines. Guidelines which the registrar has to use to ensure that any trade union that applies for registration complies with them for them to be a valid trade union. So what we are about to do now, basically, is I'm going to go through these guidelines as per the Labor Relations Act, and then we are going to I'm going to show the correlations where the PSCU Constitution uh, satisfies these guidelines, and, and um, making sure that we are a valid uh, trade union. So after this process, Nini is onje niti PSCU. So, <laughs> so, firstly, um, in the Labor Relations Act, the Section 95, no trade union can be uh, registered unless it meets these particular guidelines. Uh, the first one is basically any organization cannot be registered as a trade union unless it's an association of employees and its principal purpose is to regulate the relations between its members and employers. Did you, did you get that right? So you, uh, it has to be a, an organization, a trade union has to basically serve employees and it has to regulate the relationship between Im its members and employers. The second one is that the constitution of the union must prescribe the qualifications for its membership. It must also pro place appropriate qualification for its membership, meaning basically uh, the, the, it has to be clear that it, it does it represent employees, that it represents uh, uh, different types of, or maybe you are a, a casual worker, maybe you are, oh, okay. So maybe you are a public servant, maybe you work for corporates, maybe you work for private entities, etc. Or you work for NGO, etc. It must specify in your constitution. Another thing is that the union must recruit members as members' employees who are in employment. So you must be in employment to be a member of a union. You cannot be a, a retrenched or unemployed or self-employed, or entrepreneur, you know, you have to be employed. And particularly for this service, you have to be part of the public service. And then, um, moving on, it says here, another guideline says, uh, the union must be seeking and obtaining recognition from employers as collective bargaining representative of, of its members. Basically, it must be part of, uh, it must be part of a collective bargaining council. Where it, where it basically argues or fights for its workers with the em particular employers. A union may only be registered and continue to operate as a registered union if it is independent. A union has to be independent. It ma cannot be a, a PSCU powered by ESCOM or PSCU you know, working in line with the government, etc. It has to be, it has to be uh, independent so that it can be impartial and can uh, be able to fight f and represent the interests of its workers or its members. Do you understand? Also, it must um, hold regular meetings of its members. It must establish effective function of branches. It must have different various branches. It must elect shop stewards in the, represent, in the, in the selected uh, employers where it has membership. And it must elect members as office bearers. 
Are we clear on that? Okay. So, I just uh, last two is that a trade union must state that it's an association not for, prof for, for profit gain. It must be specific in how it raises money through subscriptions from its members or donations or gifts, etc. And then lastly, the, uh, the major source of revenue for trade unions is a subscription fee, which is your membership fee. This is per the guidelines of the LRA. Now, as per the constitution of um, the PSCU, which we drafted after in, in consultation with various as experts uh, and put it together to make sure that we meet these guidelines so that the registration is successful and we are in line with what it, what, what, what's needed by, as per the Labor Relations Act. So the first one is explained, an organization cannot be registered as a trade union unless it's an association of employees. Principle rule one of the union's constitution specifically states that the union's object is to regulate the relations between members and their employers and improve members' employment conditions and promotion prospects. So that's how it's it it satisfied in the constitution as per the principle rule one. Secondly, uh, the constitution of the union must prescribe the qualifications for its membership. It must also place appropriate qualification and membership. Section 3 of the union's constitution uh, sets out provisions for ordinary membership, associate membership, and lifetime membership. Uh, I don't know if you've received the packages. It's in your, it's in your bag or what, but the constitution of the union has been given, provided to you. So as I go along, you can check these sections. So the union must uh, recruit as members or employees who are in employment. Section 31 of the union's constitution of the PSCU's, U, PSCU's constitution says that an ordinary member of the union shall be a person who is employed by the state or state agency, SOEs, parastatal, or any public body created in terms of the Labor Relations Act. It also provides that it shall be a person employed by a private body created in terms of the Labor Relations Act or Companies Act, which could be in support of a state designated by the NEC. Uh, it also, uh, the guidelines also propose that uh, it must be seeking and obtaining recognition from employers as collective bargaining councils. Section five of the union's constitution sets out the representational structures of the union provides that the union shall be organized so as to promote the method which is most effective for representing members' interests in negotiation with employment, employing bodies and for the representation of their professional occupational concerns. A guideline in, as per section 16 of the LRA states that a union may only be registered and continue to operate as a registered union if it is independent. How this is meant is that the principal rules of the union are uh, objective as per the constitution is that the primary objective is to provide that the union must protect the interests of the employees and ensure that it forms collective bargaining union organization that are independent of the employer it holds membership of. Uh, lastly, a union must be an association of employees. It must hold the regular meetings of its members. If you look at section four, of the constitution it states that regulating the function of branches and the various meetings it ought to hold meetings either in respect of the AGM, the nomination of annual delegate conference or any other general meeting. It says uh, the guidelines will say must establish an effective functions of branches. Section 4 again of the union's constitution says um, uh, provides that branches shall be organized at the discretion of the NEC and regulate the function of that branch. Uh, it must also elect shop steward, as that is also covered in section 4, and then it must elect members as office bearers. Section 7 of the constitution and section 8 makes provision for the election of an NEC and makes a provision for election of full-time office bearers. Lastly, a, u a trade union must state that it's an association for no gain. Meaning in section 9, if you look at section 9 of the constitution, there's provision for finances, which the power of the NEC is to ensure that the union isn't a profit-based organization, and rather it may only profit through raising money by way of subscriptions, levies, or otherwise it accepts gifts and operates 
trust relations of any of the such gifts. And then uh, the last guideline also provides that it can only raise money through subscription fees. If you look at section 314 of the, of the, um, of the constitution, it provides a subscription will be the primary paying method for members. This is the only way in which money will be raised. I think on that notion we can move uh, to uh, the adoption of the resolution. Basically, ordinary resolution number one. If there's any questions, we can move forward. Yeah, I'm going to be reading ordinary res resolution number one in page one. If you all have this type, this booklet, where we are now uh, going to be appointing the uh, national elective conference uh, uh, committees. Sorry, the NEC. Okay. Ordinary resolution 1.1 to 1.10, election of the NEC and office bearers. Are we all on the same page? Okay. Ordinary, oh, the following members have been nominated as founding NEC members and office bearers unopposed. Ordinary resolution number 1.1. We resolve that the appointment of Dr. Vuyo Janti will be the president with effect from the 13th of December 2021, is approved and confirmed as required in terms of the PSU constitution. Is that clear? Uh -huh. Dr. Vuyo, can they see you? That's Dr. Vuyo over there. <laughs> Ordinary resolution number 1.2. It resolves the appointment of Ms. Astrid Al-Anani as Deputy President with effect from 13th December 2021 was approved and confirmed as required in terms of the PSCU Constitution. Dr. Ms. Astrid, can they see you please? <laughs> These are firepowers, eh? Yeah, I'd ask, I'd ask them to step forward, please, so that everyone can see them properly. Dr. Vuyo, could you step forward? Okay. We've reserved, we've reserved the nice, dedicated aisle there for you as the NEC, as you are the bosses now. <laughs> so, ever call out your name, please come forward and sit right there. Ordinary resolution number 1.3, we resolve that the appointment of Ms. Bunolo Mutobi, as the NEC member with effect from the 13th December 2021, is approved and confirmed as required in terms of the PSCU constitution. Ms. Bunolo, <laughs> give a round of applause, thank you. Uh -huh. Ordinary resolution number 1.4, we resolve that the appointment of Ms. Sana Makole, Mrs. Mr. Sana, Mrs. Mrs. Sana Makole, sorry, as the NEC member of with effect from 13 December 2021 is approved and confirmed as required in terms of PSU constitution. Mrs. Sana Makole. <laughs> Ordinary resolution number 1.5, uh, there have been a change, is that there is, we resolve that the appointment of Professor Amina Ngubani as NEC member with effect from 13 December 2021 is approved and confirmed as required in terms of the PSCU constitution. Professor? <laughs> oh, you also want to drop the professor title. <laughs> <laughs> Ordinary resolution number 1.6. We resolve the appointment of Dr. Nobulali Maneli as the NEC member with effect from 13 December 2021 is approved and confirmed as required in terms of the PSCU constitution. Dr. Nobulali? Okay, she's absent, but can we give a, a round of applause? <laughs> Ordinary resolution number 1.7, we resolve the appointment of Mr. Sidney Shabalala as the NEC member with effect from 13 December 2021 is approved and confirmed as required in terms of the PSCU constitution. Mr. Sidney Shabalala. 
There we go. Ordinary resolution number 1.8. We resolve that the appointment of Mr. Saji, governor, NEC member with effect from 13 to December 2021 is approved and confirmed as required in terms of the PSCU constitution. Mr. Govender. There we go. Ordinary resolution number 1.9. We resolve the appointment of Mr. Stepo Setabola as the NEC member with effect from 13 December 2021 is approved and confirmed as required in terms of the constitution. Mr. Tepo. A round of applause. Ordinary resolution number 1.10, we resolve the appointment of Ms. Modikoa Mulepo as NEC member with effect from 13 December 2021 is approved and confirmed as required in terms of PSC constitution. <laughs> Ms. Mulepo. Ordinary resolution number 1.11, we resolve the appointment of Ms. Beauty Kubangu as NEC member with effect from 13 December 2021 is approved and confirmed as required in terms of the PSC constitution. Ms. Tabangu. <laughs> Round of applause. <laughs> hey, we're led by a woman here. You see? <laughs> yeah? We're clear. We are very clear here. <laughs> okay. Any moves to the motion? Can I... You, you can raise your hand if you've been to a conference. When I say any move to motion, you raise your hand. If you, as you any move to motion, okay, I note you. Thank you. Thank you. Any seconds to the motion? It's seconded. Seconded down the line. Seconded, seconded. Okay, thank you. The motion is moved. <laughs> hey, where's cameraman? Can we have a picture here, please? Uh, okay. Ordinary resolution number two. Now that we have uh, the NEC, we can move to adopting the constitution. Right? Uh, ordinary resolution number two, adoption of the constitution. The draft, the PSCU constitution is, so the, the constitution is in your, this booklet, as you have all received this. We we move to adopt the, PS, the draft PSCU constitution, is supported and adopted. Any move to the motion? Any move to the motion? Adil, Crown Prince Adil Chabele, and there at the back, uh, Mohammed Khadimang. Any seconds to the motion? There we go, one, two. Okay, thank you. The motion is moved and the resolution is passed. Uh, it's just the last one. One more, we just have one more resolution. Okay, if we can all turn to page 26. So page 26. Ordinary resolution number three, where are uh, is the election of the National Appeals Committee. We are basically, as in this conference, we are going to give the NEC the powers to elect a National Appeals Committee. Okay? So I'm going to read it for all of us. Ordinary resolution number three, the power to elect the National Appeals Committee is hereby delegated to the uh, NEC by way of a separate resolution. Any moves to the motion? Any seconds to the motion? There we go, over there. Thank you. Uh, the motion is moved. And a round of applause. The last uh, resolution will base. Uh, we are basically also going to be delegated. The next page, twenty-seven. If you go to page twenty-seven, we are delegating the NEC with the powers to appoint an auditor. We are already giving you duties. <laughs> Ordinary resolution number four: appointment of auditors. 
The power to appoint the auditor is hereby delegated to the NEC on recommendation by the General Secretary during the second quarter of 2022. Any moves to the motion? Would you stand up and say your name? Aha. Uh -huh. Any seconds to the motion? Stand up and say your name, please. Thank you. The motion is moved. A round of applause. <laughs> Lastly, uh, uh, we are basically doing the last resolution, which is the one we are giving a serious task to the NEC, where they're going to uh, appoint the person who will run around for them, which is the general secretary. <laughs> so go to page 28 on your, pay, on your, on your, on your booklets. Here we are in ordinary resolution number five. The NEC will announce the appointment of the general secretary. We'll do it now, okay? Any moves to this motion? Okay. Okay, thank you. Any seconds to the motion? Okay, thank you. Thank you. The motion is moved. This resolution will be passed in the NEC. We have the task of, uh, of announcing who your general secretary will be. Uh, we'll ask the president to do that. You can come up, sir. As the president is coming up, uh, he was consulting with his NEC already. They had work. Amanda. Let's make sure we get to those spaces and create two more. If it needs to be a dusty, bumpy road, let it be. I was just making sure that I'm not picking the wrong name. You see, making a double check. It is the honor with the power vested on the NEC of the PSCU to announce. Can you guess? <laughs> Can you guess? The name of Tahir. <laughs> Can you please come forward? Oh <laughs> come forward. Come forward. Come forward. We'll have uh, the president give us an acceptance speech. And then, for the first time ever, we'll have the general secretary say so as the general secretary. Before he was speaking as Dyer, now he'll speak as the general secretary. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Mr. President, your acceptance speech? Okay. Can you give him a round of applause again? On page uh, 29, uh, we are confirming that the date of the next meeting will be confirmed by the NEC. And so just waiting, for pres okay, as our president is going to give us his acceptance speech. Thank you. For Round of applause for our president. Amaza! Amaza! How are you too?
Good morning all. The manner in which I'm excited, it's so hard for me even to express words. You know, it's so, it's so charming. It is so loving when I see people on the ground coming up with theory of new knowledge, of new development, coming from the root, coming from us. Not talking of Pythagoras of, of, of 1919, whereas we have moved. Let's pray and say, God, thank you that you, you are in touch with us. That you can fly beyond the sky, beyond everything, as long as you are with us. No fears. I heard speaker said, no fears. Program director, deputy president, fellow NEC members, distinguished guests, and members of the PSCU, and our well-wishers. It is an honor for me to be present here today to accept the position of president, PSCU, an organization with that will prove that it is possible to serve without expectation, to toil without seeking reward. Over the next four years, we intend on our strength and previous experiences, but also take on new directions. We will strengthen our resolve for professionalism through education, training, and resources. We will also retain our commitment to solidarity, ensuring that our members that are less resourced can have more opportunities and assistance to develop their skills. The method and operation, operating frameworks in order to respond to the future of the new world of work. To ensure that all of us are able to perform our critical role to protect, to preserve, and make justice accessible to the working class. When we have a strategic priority to position PSCU as essential for good governance, administrative transparency, and democratic accountability, we cannot accomplish by only one convincing each other. We must be seen to be what we purport to be. We need to influence contemporary thinking about governance and administration to ensure that laws, policies, government structures, and financial investment decisions are in the interest of the workers so that our communities can flourish and enjoy the freedoms that we are evasive to ordinary citizens. As tried and tested trade unions, trade unionists, we have a deep understanding of our environment. We understand its vulnerabilities, its sensitivities, and of course, its long-term value. We have a lot to offer to the working class within and outside of our scope, to government, business, and to the broader community as they wrestle with the issues of harsh economic reality. And if we do it right, I know our contribution will be welcomed and appreciated. Of course, there are many challenges ahead. Almost all of us face difficult financial constraints, and some of us are currently facing very tough national and local issues that affect our ability to achieve our full potential. But let's not forget, we are not just a start-up union. You know, all the leaders sitting in front collectively, we have unbeatable decades of experience by our values and rich with talent. PSCU is here to correct, to punish, and to restore. To correct the mistake done by unions that are entangled in identity crisis, not knowing who they serve anymore. To punish those are stealing our future and prosperity to restore the dignity of the working class and our people in general. Let us on December the 13th 
look each other straight in the eyes and take satisfaction in the fact that we have chosen to work a straight but narrow path and we are going to give it our best to grow this union. Let this day be remembered for the spirit of activism that we will confront our fears and defeat them so that we can confront those who have made corona a scapegoat for our suffering. The thieves, the liars, the reprobate in suits. Let's mark this meeting in history. Let's open the door to the future. That will be brightened by our sweat and blood because the future of our children is worth the sacrifice we are about to make. Let's get it done now. Let's build the PSCU. And it's well wish us to clean the house that is filled with filth. Thank you, Kialebuha. Amanda! Viva PSU! Viva! Thank you very much. Okay, uh, comrades, Amanda, 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 uh, comrades, uh, we are coming to a crucial time uh, of national interest. Um, when we go outside, and I think that's one thing which I forgot, we are going to take a uh, 10 minutes break and then we come back the bathroom towards your right and there is tea outside which will be served but also as part of um, PSCU one of the things which will be integral part of the organization is to make sure that we support we promote entrepreneurs hence today there are few of them who have stalls on site Please support them so that we can build this country. And on that note, I'm just wanting to say, let us give ourselves a round of applause for allowing this process to take place. <laughs> and I just want to say to all of you that tomorrow, when we see PSCU succeeding, you will be part and parcel of this heritage. Because of all of you, you are contributing towards this organization. And where you feel that they are failing you, we must call them to order that we were part and parcel of this heritage. All of us, you've contributed. You're being here, you are creating history. So on that note, only please 10 minutes, and then so that we can conclude. Thank you.